Welcome to the first Porous Media Tea Time Talks. This is a platform for young researchers, for young researchers around the world to present their work to the Porous Media community and is meant complementary to the geoscience and geo webinar, geoenergy webinar, which you can find in our feature channels. I am Maya Rucker from Imperial College London, and right now I'm here with Marcel Mora from Paul Lab, the University of Oslo, Kamal Singh from Harriet Watt, Tom Boltrace from Ghent University, and Mohamed Noura from University of Oslo. I hope you have all your tea ready for the first two presentations, and with this I'm handing over to today's session chairs, Tom and Marcel. All right, Maya, thank you very much. So uh, we'll start today with uh, Joachim Brodin from the University of Oslo. He'll be talking about a 3D scanning technique that uh, he started to develop in his uh, master's and he continued forward in uh, his PhD now. So Joachim, floor is yours. Thank you, Marcel. So um, I'm just going to start my timer. So I'm Joachim Falbrodin. As Marcel said, I'm at the University of Oslo doing a PhD. And the topic for this talk is going to be uh, visualizing 3D multiphase flows in porous media. So it's a qualitative topic, so to speak. No equations today. And uh, I'll just jump right into it. Yeah. So I'm just letting these images speak a little bit for themselves. So this could be many different things, of course, but. Um, it's not some kind of fungi, it's not a germ. This is a two-phase flow in porous media. So, um, yeah, that's one way to look at it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go a little bit into how these images are developed and what they signify and what we can do with these images in terms of uh, deriving some physics. So I'll start with the experimental setup. So it's an optical 3D scanner and it's based on refractive index matching. So this basically means that um, we're basing it on uh, things being optically transparent. Here you can see the setup. It has two digital cameras that move through a sample with the porous medium. And that's uh, in this box here, everything's transparent, but in the fluid phases, there's uh, fluorescent dyes that are being uh, activated by a laser sheet that pass through the sample, and then we record it frame by frame. So we do two-dimensional uh, images and put them together to a three-dimensional sample. And they look like this. So this is our raw data here that's being put together, and then it's segmented and uh, rebuilt as a 3D model. So I'll just show you what an experiment can look like with this setup. So the porous medium is a randomly packed glass bead, all same size, three millimeters in this case. And the beads are in a cubic flow cell. This cell is about eight by eight by eight centimeters. And we start by a defending fluid, which here has a red fluorescent type. And then we inject another fluid from the top, green in this case. So this fluid is more dense and more viscous. And uh, here we're capturing one frame every two minutes. And they're replayed here a lot faster, obviously. And we run the experiment till uh, one, till the waiting fluid reaches the bottom. So what do we do to try to make sense of this? So this is uh, the main experimental result, the invasion body. And as you can see, it has a lot of the geometry, a lot of characteristics that we can uh, try to analyze and make sense of. So what we've done in this case is 10 experiments at different fixed flow rates. And then we try to put what we see into context. So as you can see, there is a change as the flow rate increases, the structure is getting more and more uh, dense and uh, more and more concentrated. So the blob, so to speak, is getting more and more compact as the flow rate is increased. So it's uh, the density of invasion is basically increasing. So could we perhaps find a way to uh, put this into a function, something that describes uh, what is going on? So 
there is uh, one thing that we've been looking at. So basically, we've uh, seen that there is a zone with near complete invasion near the inlet. And we've seen that this zone is increasing as the flow rate is increased. Basically, the massive blob of our structure is getting bigger and bigger with flow rate. And uh, what we can do is maybe try to segment out this stable massive part and try to see if this one has some sort of uh, functionality that goes with the flow rate. So here is an example where I tried one method to segment out the massive part. This is done by a morphological opening. It's a process called uh, uh, erosion dilation. So I'm not going to go into that, but there's many, many ways you could approach this. So this is basically just one. And here you can see that the, the flow is reaching the bottom of the cell and starting to pour into the walls. So obviously everything is becoming massive. So we're sort of past the, the moment where this is a good description of anything. So I'll just move on. Now, another thing we've been looking at is to see if we can uh, analyze this through a description of the pore space. So uh, here is a little bit of a cinematic voyage into the pore space. So you now all have uh, the soundtrack of the interstellar running, except for the copyright issues that prevented me from actually putting it on. I'm not sure if it's uh, copyright right infringement to make you imagine it's playing, but um, yeah. So uh, I'm just uh, there's a quote there for from an article that talks about how to segment out this pore space. So the pore space is basically uh, the inverse of our uh, bead matrix. So it's the fluid body that is there uh, as the defending fluid. And then there's a number of steps to go through to arrive at uh, what we see here, which is a fully segmented uh, pore space. So uh, this pore space has a very detailed uh, description of what's going on. It has uh, uh, connectivity, volume for each pore, central mass, and such things. So uh, it's a very useful starting point in terms of uh, of uh, many different possibilities in terms of describing uh, what is going on here. We can, for instance, uh, count how many neighboring pores uh, each pore is uh, connected to. And we can, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it, uh, it's uh, an open field, so to speak. And I should mention while we're here that uh, all of this work that I've been showing here is uh, on the lines of uh, many other projects going around in the community with different uh, scanners, different setups. And uh, it's also based on uh, work uh, that has been done in terms of the analysis and geometrical approaches from many fields. So even though uh, I guess uh, the whole 3D in forest media is now a very emerging field, there's been a lot of stuff going on for quite some time. So I'm actually now a little bit ahead of time for once. So that's uh, interesting. But uh, that means that we can take a good moment now and go back to the beginning and uh, look at this uh, video of the blob invading the descending food. And hopefully it all makes a little bit more sense to you all now. So, uh, I guess we're just going to take the extra time that I've, uh, so to speak, accumulated and uh, and have a slightly longer Q&A. Thank you, Joachim, for this great talk. Really nice visualizations as well. Um, I'd just like to um, mention that everyone who wants to ask a question can type it in the comment section. And we already have a few uh, questions, so let's start with this one by Matthijs de Winter, who is asking if the experiment is repeated in the same volume with spheres, or if the packing of spheres is made new for each experiment. Is it one-to-one -one comparable? It's, it's made new for each experiment. So, I mean, 
So hypothetically, you could center the the glass beads to to lock them in place, so to speak, so kind of weld them together. But actually, this would create a lot of practical issues in terms of cleaning the cell between experiments. Is one issue, and another one would actually be how you prepare the cell fully saturated with the defending fluid. That's, uh, I mean, I guess you could possibly achieve it with some kind of vacuum processes or such. So, um, so the answer is that it's a new, it's a completely new porous medium every time. And also then I should add that given the system size, this actually ha has some uh, real significance because uh, you can have uh, fluctuations in the porous medium that will make each experiment quite different actually. So um, this is definitely one of the things that we're thinking of and that is a concern, so to speak, but uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, we have another question from Wright de Himalaya, who is saying, who's asking, what are the limits of sample size? Well, the limit of sample size is given a little bit by, there's two things, basically. It's the optical properties uh, as the overall uh, issue. So basically, you need to be able to penetrate uh, both with the laser and with the, the the rays emitted from the laser and the index matching is obviously not perfect and there will be some degree of, of absorption in the in the fluids I mean there's uh, pollution there there's dust and stuff uh, and then you have every single interface between fluid fluid and fluid uh, solid body is a, a slight source of uh, of a disturbance or a refraction. So basically uh, you could, in a sense, increase your system size by using smaller beads, for instance, but then you have the problem that you create a lot more interfaces in, in the same volume. So it's not necessarily solving your problem. So there is a definite limitation. And obviously I've tried to push the limit on this. So I've tried to make the system Pretty much as large as I can, but you can go a bit larger uh, at the cost of quality. So you can, and then you don't get uh, as good images, but you can go a bit larger. Thanks. A uh, question by Willem Bart Bartels asking, what is the packing procedure? Yeah, so the packing procedure is basically just to pour the beads into the defending food. So that's kind of the the easiest way to get a fully saturated uh, sample is to sort of fill the cell halfway with defending fluid and then pour the bead pack in. So I always weigh out the same amount of beads and pour them slowly in. And I actually stir as I pour to, to get rid of bubbles. So it's a sort of stirred random packing. And it has a filling fraction somewhere between... Uh, loose and close random packing with this actually okay. slight variation from experiment to experiment okay and then probably final question by Steffenberg. in which way is the approach different from the one at harvard university well <laughs> i don't remember the details of the particular one in harvard university but i guess you know i would say that the only thing i can say is that I've pretty much sort of Googled and then intuitively gone my way. And so, so it's randomly different in a way. So then, and then also the setup dictates a little bit what you attempt to do with the setup. So, uh, but, uh, a, but I'll be more than happy to, to answer any emails uh, about uh, the details of the setup and uh, what I think are the possibilities and limitations. But, uh, I can't specifically compare because I don't remember the details of the hardware, hardware uh, setup. Okay, great. Thank you again, uh, Joachim, for this great talk. Thank you also for your questions. You. Uh, and then let's move to the second speaker of today. Uh, the second speaker is Arjen Machini. He worked in digital rock industry for a few years and then 
uh, started doing a PhD at Ghent University, which is still pursuing today, uh, about characterizing multi-phase flow in porous media and especially uh, looking at wettability. And he'll be sharing some results about that with us today. Arian? Okay. Thank you very much, Tom, for uh, the introduction. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for tuning in and a massive thanks to the committee to give me the opportunity to present my research today. In my presentation, I'll focus on the analysis of 4D image data of multi-phase flow. I'll show how we can use this data to calculate contact angles on an event-by-event -event basis to improve our understanding of the role of wettability on multi-phase flow at the pore scale. Wettability is the affinity of the solid to be preferentially in contact with one fluid over the other. It is typically quantified by using a contact angle between the fluid-fluid interface and the solid surface. This works really well for a model system where we have a smooth surface and a homogeneous porous medium, but real porous media like rocks are more complex as they can contain surface roughness, different minerals, or surfaces that contain surface coatings which all influences the wettability. Moreover, we need to sort of be careful about uh, the fact that these contact angles are skill dependent and also depend on the state of the system when they are measured. Understanding how wettability controls the flow of the fluids within a porous rock is crucial for, for example, safe storage of CO2 within the subsurface. This makes the topic of wettability characterization, a very active one within the multi-phase flow research community. Micro X-ray tomography has been used extensively in the last few years to characterize wettability. But this was done mainly using images of static fluid distribution at the end of drainage or imbibition cycles to measure contact angles for all points on the three-phase contact line. This geometric method generates millions of data points, but the spread in this data is usually large, with around 20 to 40 degrees being quite common. This raises the question on what the contact angles measured in this way actually represent. Because what we need is a contact angle that is relevant for the fluid displacement events that cause the, uh, the fluid distribution, and not some contact angle that just represent the local interface dynamics. I will try to illustrate this schematically here for a process called primary drainage, where a non-wetting fluid, given here in red, is displacing a wetting fluid, given here in blue. In this subsurface, the flow rates tend to be quite slow, so these displacements are, tend to be dominated by capillary forces. Before this particular displacement event, the interface is stuck in a pore throat. The fluid-fluid interface can then be characterized by a certain radius of curvature and a contact angle between the interface and the, fluid surf and the solid surface. The interface will remain at the pore throat until the local capillary pressure is high enough for the interface to move into the neighboring pore. At the onset of the event, the interface has a specific radius of curvature related to the threshold capillary pressure, while the event contact angle gives us the information on the local wettability. Note that this event contact angle is an effective value and it's different from the contact angle measured at the molecular scale. But it is this effective contact angle that we're interested in if we want to characterize the displacement event, and it's also the one that we're interested in when we're doing numerical simulation of multiphase flow at this scale. In the work I will present here today, we will aim to calculate these event contact angle for individual pore filling event using time-resolved micro X-ray tomography. Time-resolved micro X-ray tomography or 4D micro CT allows us to image fluid displacement in 3D in near real time. This can be done at a synchrotron or using certain lab-based systems. The output of a 4D micro CT is a sequence of 3D images that we need to compare with each other to evaluate where in our sample fluid displacements take place. This is not a straightforward task as we deal with hundreds of gigabytes of data. In this presentation, I will use the data of Schluter et al. 2016 of a primary drainage 
experiment in a sintered glass sample to demonstrate our workflow. As a first step in our analysis, we use a high quality micro CT image of the sample to extract a pore network. The network gives us a frame of reference to know the location of each pore as well as its connectivity. So far, so for example, we know that the yellow pore here is, uh, has a specific location and we know it's connected to the blue pore to the right. For each micro CT image in our time series, we then check on a pore by pore basis what the fluid occupancy is. This allows us to see that the yellow pore is not filled at time zero, but is filled with a red non-wetting fluid at time one. We then calculate the geometric contact angle only for the pores that are being filled and its direct neighbors at the time step before the event takes place. This is how we define the, the event-based contact angle. So for the example of the blue and the uh, yellow pore, we uh, we calculate the average contact angle at T0 for both the yellow and blue pore together. When we do this for all our micro CT images in our data set, we see that the calculated event-based contact angle shows a much narrower distribution compared to using a static fluid distribution. Also, it allows us to study the 3D distribution of contact angles, which can subsequently be incorporated into numerical simulations of multi-phase flow. To assess the accuracy of, the, of, this, of our method, we introduce a second independent uh, contact angle that we call the force-based contact angle. Instead of, because instead of calculating contact angles per event, we can also calculate the interfacial curvature from the images, uh, giving us the threshold capillary pressure for each event. Calculating pressures have the advantage that we can compare them directly to pressure measures, uh, pressures measured using external pressure transducers during the experiment. This sort of external verification is something that we do not have when we are uh, calculating contact angles. From the threshold capillary pressure per event, we can then use a model like the Young Laplace for a cylindrical pore throat to back calculate what the contact angle would have been for the event. In the equation, we can also use the info local information from the pore network on, for example, the pore throat radii. The independent force-based contact angle method we, uh, shows a remarkable consistent result with the geometric event-based contact angle that we calculate geometrically, giving us co a confidence that our, our method is actually working. So far, we have demonstrated our method using only drainage data for water wet samples. So in the future, we would like to expand our work to imbibition and also to mixed wet samples. In addition, we want to further investigate the effect of the limited spatial and temporal resolution we have in 4D micro CT data on our results. In this presentation, I've tried to show how we can use 4D micro CT to track individual pore filling events. We can then calculate event based contact angles that show a much narrower distribution compared to contact angles measured on static fluid distribution. We introduce a conceptual independent force-based contact angle that we show is in mutual agreement with the one measured on, uh, geometrically on the images. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge that the data and some of the methods that we used um, in this research. And if you're interested in reading more about this, our paper is out now in the Journal of Colloid and Interfacial Sciences. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions there might be. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Ariane. So we move on to the questions. Uh, and the first one is from Raid de Himalaya. So he says, nice analysis. What is the minimum resolution at which you can obtain results correctly? So there have been some, some really uh, interesting papers coming out about this from the group from Imperial College where they 
do multi-phase flow simulations using different resolutions. And actually, what they what they find is that you would need at least for uh, at least eight voxels um, to correctly characterize a pore throat to calculate the interfacial curvature. So with that, that so it depends on your sample, and then you need sort of need to back calculate on what the minimum resolution needs to be. Mm -hmm. Right. Another one from l.f.yan. So I wonder, is the event contact angle dynamic or constant? That is, uh, well, that is an interesting question. Uh, I, I would say, I would say it's, it, it is, uh, we're here looking at the dynamic uh, system. So the data set that I showed is an unsteady state drainage experiment. So the fluids are flowing. So in that respect, this would be a dynamic contact angle. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about, at least, we're not talking about equilibrium contact angles. That's what I, what I'm, uh, what I mean with that. Um, William Bart Bartels asks, I'm curious, why did, you, why did you decide to have a look at the event contact angles in the first place? So, um, this all comes from that we were reading about the uh, calculating contact angles from micro CT images, and that we saw that you have this very broad distribution in contact angles. And we were wondering if we could find out what is causing this broad distribution. Is this primarily caused by image artifacts or is there a physical reason behind that? And we think that by, uh, that we, because we get a much narrower dis distribution for event-based contact angle, that at least some part of the variation scatter that we see in our data is associated with the fact that we are uh, measuring contact angles, not, um, yeah, at least on a full distribution, not on interfaces that are actually moving at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from Stefan Berg. Can you distinguish between advancing and receding contact angles? Can you measure contact angle hysteresis? Well, so I would say in order to distinguish between advancing and receding contact angles, we would need to sort of see more than one contact angle. So uh, in this case, we only looked at, at drainage. So we would only see, principally see only uh, receding contact angles. But so if we were to uh, do this uh, same analysis on the same sample for both drainage and inhibition, we could look at contact angle hysteresis. And we could show like the difference between uh, in the, in the contact angles measured in a single pore for both drainage and imbibition, which would give you some idea about the hysteresis. Right. Another question from Servan Naderi. Have you considered contact angle measurements in multi-cycle, multi-phase flow injection regarding the change in wettability during EOR processes? So this is what we, what I've showed today are just really the first steps that we've taken. So uh, we now show it on sh to work on the most simple case that is drainage in a water wet porous medium. So we would like to expand to more complicated scenarios such as imbibition and mixed wet for, and then like afterwards indeed, like you could think about applying the same method to uh, analyzing EOR, the EOR type of experiments, yes. Mm -hmm. So now uh, moving on to the final question um, from Miral Talvik. Thanks for a great talk, Arjen. In slide 13, is the number of contact angles calculated the same for both the static and event-based cases? And do you think that the number of contact angles calculated is a contributor the narrower distribution in the case of event-based contact angles? So slide 13. Yes. Uh, excuse me. So could you please repeat the, uh, the question? Yes, sure. Sorry. sure. It's a two-part <laughs> question. So, um, so in slide 13, is the number of contact angles calculated the same for both the static and event-based cases? And 
contacts. Do you con do you think that the number of contact angles calculated is a contributor to the narrower distribution in case of event-based contact angles? Mm -hmm. So, the to answer the first part of the question, no, it's not the same number of contact angle measurements. Uh, the distribution shown here and in black on this uh, this uh, static distribution that's actually a full image where i did like the full analysis on all points on the interface at the end of primary drainage so that is indeed like uh, about a million data points or more whereas in the red this is uh, about uh, 223 data points because during drainage we have identified 223 individual pore thinning events so mm -hmm. the whole point actually of this analysis was to sort of narrow down the number of data points that to that we use to only include the ones that are relevant for the displacement events. Right. So if the number of data points was much larger in the event based, do you think that the spread of the curve would uh, would get larger, or would it remain more or less the same? I, I would think that it will be more or less the same. Mm -hmm. Right. Super. So thank you very much. Yes, uh, you. Again, and uh, you again. And uh, I think with that, uh, we can uh, start uh, closing our session for today. And uh, on behalf of the whole team, I would like to really thank everyone who, who joined today. I guess we're really happy. The participation was, uh, was quite uh, larger than what we would have, would need to be happy. So that's excellent. Uh, if you have any feedback, you can send that to us to, to the email that you see on the screen. It's porousmediattt at gmail.com. And uh, well, if something didn't work uh, as well as it should, we apologize. I mean, we are all early career researchers, but uh, our career as uh, YouTubers is even at an earlier stage here. So we are, we are just uh, beginning here. And uh, I think I would like to take the chance to, to advertise the next session, which will take place two weeks from now. So we'll, we'll try to keep the Tea Time Talks once every second week. And it's the next one is on the 14th of July at uh, TAM, uh, Central European Summertime. And uh, you see the speakers there. So a couple of days before that, you're probably going to be spammed by emails from all of us to remind you about the presentation. So if you haven't done so, please, as we are YouTubers now, like and subscribe our channel, and you'll be hearing again from us. Thank you again. Bye from everyone. <laughs>